Now stay tuned to the following radio broadcast. You're listening to the Victory Station, AM 1360. We're glad you chose us. Thank you. It's Impact with the Florida Star, the largest, oldest, and most read African-American newspaper in Northeast Florida and South Georgia. And now, here's the host, the publisher of the award-winning Florida Star, Clara McLaughlin. This is OPO. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Impact. Got a great show lined up for you as usual. A good friend of mine, Bobby Beverly, a historian, just got a book out called American History, an all-black perspective, as well as Iris Goodwin. She came here to Jacksonville and did a documentary on football called Loyalty right here on Impact. <music> Iris Goodwin, filmmaker. She just got a film out called Loyalty about the yes. 8U Woodland Acres Wolverines right here in Jacksonville. How you doing, Iris? I'm good today, sir. How are you? Great, great. What is this film about? Okay, so this, this is a documentary film that's about my journey there in Jacksonville in the end of 2016 and I was there to take care of my mom, and I got an opportunity to meet these eight-year-old football players, and I literally fell in love with these guys, and they became my hope and inspiration while I was dealing with my own personal issues with my mom, and I found strength and courage in these young fellas. So where do you live now, uh, in, and you say you had to come down here to Jacksonville? Yeah, well, I, I live in New York City. I was born and raised in New York, but my parents and my family is from Jacksonville, Florida. When I was in high school, I got an opportunity to uh, come to Jacksonville and live shortly. I graduated from Stanton High School, go Stanton Blue Devils, and I came back to New York with my career, which actually started in Jacksonville, but... Presently, I've moved back. You know, I live back in Jacksonville, but every opportunity I... I'm sorry, I live in New York, but every opportunity I get, I come to Jacksonville. Why this film? Why this uh, 8U Woodland Acres Wolverines? Well, these guys, these guys are tough. These guys, you know, they're, they're loyal to the game of football. They're loyal to their coaches. Um, I just got the opportunity to follow them around. In which, in which it wasn't something that was planned. And I happened to meet Coach Said Session and his team. And these, for some reason, the, the courage that these young men portrayed and the inspiration that they had, you know, just made me fall in love with them. And it just worked out that way. Now, tell us a little bit about the film. What's in it? Who's doing what? What's the climax of the film? Okay, so um, it, it follows my journey there, you know, everyday life of taking care of my mom, you know, going from the hospital to the nursing homes into independent living situation. And, and what would happen is the doctors, you know, when you're a caretaker and doctors tell you, you know, caretakers have to take care of themselves. That's what I did. I found these young fellas in my photography. I'm a filmmaker since the age of 17. So... I found myself, you know, just finding hope on that Saturday morning when there was nothing I could do for her. When she had to have her treatment, I would go and, you know, hang out with these guys. So it's about the journey, the journey of life. You know, most of us, are, you know, someone that have taken care of a loved one, you know, that was going through a sickness. So it's about being dedicated and being loyal to the people you love and to what we love. And my mom is in it, you know, her journey, our journey together. Dolores Bradford is her name. And it's just about love. It's a family film. It's about kids loving the game of football. It's about the culture loving kids. It's about us uplifting the young people in Jacksonville, Florida. So it was an honor for me. It was like I found a new life in Jacksonville. So the, I don't want to give the film away, but it's also about their journey to the championship because these kids already know they want to go to college. They want to play professional football. They know football. They love football. And they, they stuck to it. And so it takes the film follows them throughout their journey from 
from uh, the first game all the way to the playoffs. And it's quite interesting what happened within that time frame. And that's basically what the film is about, how we all stuck together until the end and, you know, where they are today as well as, you know, their journey. I know football is is so male-driven, and you are a woman. Uh, Talk a little bit about some of the gender things that you learned about uh, when you were dealing with this film. Um, Well, first of all, I know many, many women that love football as well. I even understand there are are women coaches or women very involved in the game of football today. Uh, My goal once I retired was to work for the NFL. So my goal was to just go out. Here was an opportunity to get some practice, to get some shots done so that I could say, hey, I got experience. But I learned that it's it crosses genders. There are many wives of football players. There's many sisters, mothers. And one thing that I learned about football was that for most of the stories that I've heard from watching the football life, most of those successful football men all dedicate their success to their moms, which is great. There's a lot of fathers, a lot of coaches, but there is so much dedication to mothers in the game of football, to women, that is perhaps not talked about. And one thing I learned while I was out there shooting was the mothers were involved. The mothers pushed the boys as as much as the fathers did. A lot of these young men come from a single-parent home, mostly women, and women believe in their sons, and, and we believe in our children. And I learned that about the game of football. It's male-driven, but there's a lot of women behind the game of football as well. So it was my honor as a woman to be able to portray their story from a, a woman's perspective. How important are coaches in the life of children uh, at this age? And, and what ages are we talking about? Okay, we're, we're talking about six, they, they call their title that 6U, 8U, 10U, and 12U, and I believe 14U. So, you know, middle-aged young people from the age of, say, 6 to 15. Coaches are very, very important. I learned that as well for some of the young men that their fathers are not around or their fathers are not a, a large influence in their lives. And sometimes the coaches have to be a second dad to a lot of these kids. And they believe in their coaches. They look up to their coaches. For some of these young men, that's the first male that they turn to. And they protect their coaches as well, you know. So it's very important, it's, you know. Now, time management, uh, when children are doing these type of things, they're not on the streets, uh, they're not getting anybody pregnant, uh, the younger people uh, may get to uh, have some mentorship, uh, and, and they actually doing something other than getting in trouble. Uh, how, how important are the, are the life lessons and time management and, and those things that keep children from going through this prison system that we, we see so prevalent in the black community? That, that is very, very um, true. Some of the coaches that I interviewed spoke about that. Coach Williams talked about how if, if the kid grades are not right, then the kids are not playing sports. It's not just about football. It's about getting your grades and respecting your homes and understanding that uh, education is far more important than football because with education, you gain a life and you're able to take care of your families. So some of these kids are learning life lessons that will enable them to be strong and, and geared toward being, you know, being someone in life or getting a good education so that they can have something to fall back on. It absolutely keeps the kids off the street. Their time management is full. Like these kids go to school, they practice every day, they have games on Saturday, they may have one day off, you know, during the week for a break, but these kids are very dedicated every day. The coaches are very dedicated where they put a lot of time and effort in. I know that there is a always these race issues going on in our society. Uh, but what we see is a lot of the uh, football players, um, black and white, they get to play with each other. And a lot of the, the white guys who play with black people, they tend to be the people who speak more about uh, 
in in the favor of uh, race uh, versus being race says. And so these Pop Warner Leagues, they, you're teaching children real early, black and white, how to kind of come together, uh, no matter what race you are, and go towards the goal. Is that something that you saw there? Absolutely, absolutely. That was quite obvious. You know, there were little uh, black kids, little white kids. There were mixed kids that, you know, have black and white uh, parents. And all the kids were treated equally. The kids got along with each other. You know, hopefully this will be a lesson that they'll carry on later in their lives. But they do cross barriers. That's one thing I love about sports and music. (laughs) Somehow we have, you know, we realize that, you know, we have to cross color barriers. We have to let go of prejudice and, you know, believe in ourselves and our kids and the game of football. So football does that for these young people. It brings them together and get them to understand that they have just as much of a chance to succeed as anyone, you know, regardless of their race, color, you know, creed, you know, their weight, which is another thing that these park games, they don't, judge kids based on their weight you know their abilities and they want to teach every kid that has a desire to play football to come out and learn the lessons of life and learn how to deal with people and how to deal with losses and wins and you know everyday life now i know with football particularly in the pro area they're talking about concussions and safety and those things uh did you find out anything uh, along those lines, because I know when you're shooting this, uh, the whole issue of concussions uh, was real big in the news. Right, right. Well, one of one of the parents that I did interview spoke about that. We didn't uh, portray that a lot in the film. How, however, one particular parent, he did. He's a single parent, and his young man plays football, and his kid is one of the the smallest kids on the team. So he and and his wife. They spoke about that, you know, should we, should we not, you know, let him play based on that alone. So that technically was an issue that we kind of didn't touch big on, um, but it was spoke about. It is considered they are taught safety, you know, how to play safe, to wear their helmets and the best thing they could do. There was one young man, uh, uh, Kennedy, I um, can't remember his first name, but great kid, a uh, quarterback, Tony. TK7. <laughs> he, I asked him, do you worry about getting hurt? And the kid outright just told me, he don't worry about that. Of course, his mom is in the background, like, gagging, because she does. We do. But the kids are so focused, driven on the game that hopefully they play safe. And, you know, it is an issue that they learn, they're taught how to play the game in the safest way possible because those issues are real, you know. Now, how long did it take you to make this film, and um, what's your next project? Okay, so it took me about, uh, let's say, six months, I believe, the the entire season. I I arrived in Jacksonville, Florida, July uh, of 2016, at the end of July. I met these guys by, like, August 1st. I shot them all the way up until January, technically my last interview. And then it took me a year to edit the film. We've come up with a a one-hour project, which is phenomenal, which is a great film. And, you know, my my goal now is to be at the Sunray Theater on the 28th. We need folks to come out, get tickets in advance. The tickets are going. We really need those pre-sales to know, to show that Jacksonville is coming out for these young people. And once we screen it in Jacksonville, we may have a few more venues hopefully to come back and screen it again as well. And after this, my goal with this particular film is to enter into different film festivals and hopefully get picked up. We're waiting to hear from the Jacksonville Documentary Film Festival, which comes in September. We get accepted to that. We're on our way. And after that, you know, I have other projects, you know, in the making. There's one next project I'm going to be working on called uh, Do Women Play Drums, which is about female drum players. You know, basically the conga, you know, conga and uh, the djembe drum, things of that nature, African drum, you know, which is my goal to continue to make films. And if, if I get an opportunity to do another sports film, that would be wonderful as well. This is Opio. I am speaking to Iris Goodwin. She's a filmmaker. The film is called Loyalty, 
8U Woodland Acres Wolverines. That's right here in Jacksonville, Florida. The Sun Ray Cinema, Saturday, July 28th at 1 p.m. Uh, make sure you support this film. This is really, really incredible. Um, tell people how they can get in uh, contact with you and give them a little bit more information on what they're to expect when they go to the theater and how to get the tickets and where they can they get the tickets from. Okay. So you can uh, go to the website of the sunraycinema.com and purchase your tickets online. You'll just have to find the date, July 28th, go on, purchase your tickets you can call the theater. Uh, we have flyers out. We have our website. We have a Facebook page, Loyalty or Iris Goodwin on Facebook. You'll find me there. You'll find the page for the film there as well. Um, we're Big Shorts Films at AOL.com. You can email me. I'll respond back. You know, you can purchase the tickets online or call the theater, the Sunray Theater. They'll help you to figure out how to purchase the tickets. Do you know what media received the first Eagle Award by the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office for being the most factual? The Florida Star. Do you know which media solely addresses issues of concern for African Americans? The Florida Star. Do you know which media carries local, state, national, and international news regarding African Americans? The Florida Star. Do you know the only media that carries a special section for our youth at home and the schedule for three black television networks? Now you know the Florida Star. Northeast Florida's largest, oldest, and most read African-American newspaper. Serving since 1951 in more than 200 locations. The Florida Star. News you can use. News you can trust. The people's choice. Striving to make a difference. Subscribe today. Call 766-8834. That's 766-8834. Pick up the Florida Star in over 200 locations. Or to have it delivered, call 766-8834. The Florida Star. Speaking truth. The this is OPL. I am speaking to Mr. Bobby Beverly. He is the author of the new book, American History, an all-black perspective. How you doing, sir? I'm doing fine, my brother. Good, good. Hey, I wanted to get you on. This is really an interesting uh, title. Uh, also, the cover of the book, you have the American flag, and you have it dripping in blood, and looks like somebody's wringing it out. And below that, uh, there's the um, United States, uh, a picture of United States uh, uh, graphic, and it has uh, just a number of different words in it. Uh, they have Malcolm X, Battle of the, the Crater, it has a, a, just a number of different things. Booker T. Washington, all inside red, and uh, really, really interesting. Uh, first of all, tell us who you are and uh, what made you write this book. Okay, well, um, again, my name is Bobby Beverly. Um, I'm originally from Petersburg, Virginia. And uh, I started learning our history when I was 17 years old. I did not even know who Malcolm X was until I was 17, and that's because I took a black history class. So while I was in Portland, Oregon, um, I began my journey to higher, ed in, in higher education, starting with Portland Community College. And while I was there, um, I decided to write a book. So as I was writing the book, I had no title, I had no concept of what I wanted on the cover. But as I was just writing the book, the title would come to me. Now I'd like to thank you and uh, of course the brothers that were there and sisters as well, who helped me and guided me through this process. So you influenced me a lot in writing this book, but you, of course, didn't know that, but now you do know that. So um, I wrote the book. Uh, it was 10 pages, or excuse me, it was 10 chapters, 10 chapters. Very short book, but very concise book. And um, the idea of the cover came from, I envisioned black hands, as you notice on the cover, coming from the darkness. And, of course, they have that American flag, as you say, and it's dripping blood because it's the blood of our ancestors, because our blood has been spilled on all of this land. So those people and the events that you show there are some of those that were victimized by, by America. So all of them on the cover were not murdered by America, not physically, but mentally they were. So they were either mentally 
or physically murdered by America. So, of course, I have it uh, surrounded with the red, black, and green, which is symbolic of the flag that Marcus Garvey gave to us. Now, talk a little bit about uh, some of the things that you have in the book. I know uh, you have you talk about reparations in the book. Uh, you talk about um, man the the Constitution. Uh, you deal with uh, the founding fathers uh, of the country, um, and you I thought was interesting. You dealt with um, the years two thousand five and two thousand six. I thought that, those are interesting. Talk a little bit about what you have in the book. Okay. Um. Thank you, that's a good question. Well, what I did is I randomly went through all the history in my head, and one of the issues that we have been dealing with ever since our so-called emancipation is reparations. Now, the reparations issue ha has been dealt with um, many times, numerous times, and still being dealt with to this very day. We have not been successful in gaining what is due us. So I touched on that. Um, it is nearly impossible to get in depth with the reparations issue, and many people are not aware of what the reparations issue is about. It's not just about compensation and, and finances. It is talking about total liberation. Autonomy really is what it's talking about. And as many people know, uh, the Nation of Islam has always had something posted on the back of the, uh, the Final Call newspaper. And of course, it was Muhammad Speaks before that. And of course, it was talking about the land that was we want it. And, of course, this is not a new idea. Many people are not aware that we actually received our 40 acres in a mule twice, but it was taken away from us under the, the guise of democracy. So that was one of the things that you asked about. Also, um, uh, forgive me, brother, because I'm not, I'm not writing down what you are asking. Yeah, you, me, mentioned, so. you mentioned 2005, 2006. You were talking reparation, to, uh, just a number of really good things. Yes, sir. Well, the 2005-2006, that was when I was actually in Portland, Oregon. I was there from 2001 to 2008. That's when I returned home and completed my journey of obtaining uh, the master's degree. And then, of course, I started the process of the book. But while I was in Portland, Oregon, I noticed that Portland, Oregon is a perfect place for uh, revisiting our history because... The police, law enforcement, better known as patrols, and many people are not aware that uh, police and law enforcement comes from the patrollers. And the patrollers were mainly white, young, illiterate men, and they would travel up and down the roads of the South. And if they found anyone black who did not have proper paperwork or take place with them, uh, they would have justice exacted on them right there on that road. Now, many people, when they saw Roots, they saw the patrollers in action, but didn't understand what they were looking at. And if you recall the first Roots, the scene where Kuta Kinte was running for his freedom, and those two patrollers captured him and gave him a, a choice between castration or cutting his foot off, he chose the latter. And, of course, they cut his foot off. Those were the patrollers. So that is the reason why law enforcement has such a nasty demeanor toward people of color because they've always been wicked and demonic. And you're talking about a system set up that came out of slavery. Uh, during the Civil Rights Movement, we uh, saw that there was a lot of police officers that were involved in the negative aspects of it and, and actually terrorizing and killing people. Uh, and today you see a lot of situations that haven't changed to this day. So that, that's a point well taken. Uh, so, who you want to read this book? Who should pick this book up? Um, everyone, uh, especially whites. Uh, white America is in denial of their history. Uh, they know their history, and they know our history as well. But my focus primarily is us as a people, but I target really the children. I call them the babies. And that's from 16 up to 29. Now, most people say, well, 29, they're an adult. Well, they're an adult in the physical sense. You know, many of us that are in our 50s and 60s, we are adults in the physical sense. But the mental part of us has been eradicated, so we have a childlike, feeble mind, as they say. And this is one of the reasons why they created the word imbecile. And the word imbecile was created primarily for black people, and we are not aware of that. And so when they call us an imbecile, of course, 
know, we laughed and did things such as that. But uh, a primary example of that is many, if you know, I'm sure you remember, they had a TV show called uh, The Jack Benny Show, where his sidekick was Roscoe. And if you notice, he was a shipless black man. And of course, the first black actor, you know, Stephen Suchet, same thing. So this is something that comes from slavery, and we're not aware of that. So my target audience is primarily those 16 to 29 of us, but it's for all of us to read, and especially white America, because they need to be updated on why they do what they do and why we have such problems here in the United States. This is Othbio. I am speaking to author Bobby Beverly. He has a master's degree in history, and he just wrote a book called American History, An All-Black Perspective. Uh, where can people pick the book up? How can they get in contact with you if they wanted to uh, talk with you? What can they do? Okay. Um, right now, I'm just sh- I'm selling the book on my own right now. And, of course, you, with your uncle, he's also selling it. My brother, Khalifa Khalifa, and his daughter, um, his daughter uh, Nadira, uh, they're selling the book as well. I also have the book on Amazon for Kindle devices. It's at nine ninety nine uh, ninety five. The book sells for fifteen dollars. If anyone wants a copy of the book, they can email me at shalomo one at yahoo dot com, and that's s h o l o m h o one at yahoo dot com. Again, that's s h o l o m h o one at yahoo dot com so also I'm going to be working on what you was telling me about the ebook so right now I have the book physically and I have the book on Kindle on Amazon all right and again if they if there's um a way to call you is there some uh, phone number that they can call the or... yes uh they, they can call me at eight oh four three one eight Two five one five again. That's eight zero four three one eight two five one five. They can call me to make arrangements to have the book shipped to them directly from me, and I will autograph all the books. And are you accepting uh, speaking engagements as well? Yes, I am. Um, uh, anyone that would like for me to speak, uh, we can talk about making arrangements for me to come visit to speak. Um, I when I lecture, I lecture with PowerPoint presentations. Because our people are very visual people. If they can see the images as well as hear it, they accept it more readily than just a plain lecture. And this is something that a lot of our people that are lecturing are doing. Now, I'd like to also add, my brother, um, right now we're having a major issue with our history. And what I mean by that, uh, I've been listening to a particular radio personality whose name I'm not going to call out. Love the brother, and you know who he is, and I will tell you this offline. But... um, a lot of his guests come on and they're speaking about our history. And I sit and I listen, and they're inaccurate in some of the things they say. And I actually called his show, um, I think it was Monday, because he had a guest on, and the guest is a professor of poli sac. But he was speaking a lot about history, and he was saying some things that was not sitting well with me. For example, uh, I don't like it when people do this. And I understand it's called political correctness, but he was calling us an African-American. We're not an African-American. And that's a terminology that came about during Jesse Jackson's time when he was running for president of the United States. So there are people now that are out here, and they're speaking about our history, and they're putting out bad information. And that is something I always tell people, don't do that. Because this is a very difficult task which is disseminating our story to our people and to this nation. So if you're not in history, as Dr. John Henry Clark said, I'm not here to debate. I only debate with my equals. All others I teach. Now, most people will probably say, I don't sound arrogant. No, it wasn't arrogant. What What he was saying to the collective audience of people was, I've been studying this. I've been studying this my entire life. And I'm echoing his words because I'm in that same situation. I've been studying this. Nothing but our history. So I can call myself a historian. And I have documentation and I now have degrees from the HBCU to back me up on that. That's why Dr. Clark said what he said and I echo those words. All right. This is Bobby Beverly. His book is called American History. 
and all black perspective. Make sure y'all pick up the book. Thank you, Mr. Beverly. Yeah, thank you, my brother. All right, got to get out of here. This is Opio. I will see you next time on Impact. Impact.